Hello, and welcome to the Interactions Unit of Phys 1104. And in Lecture 1, the first thing we need to do is more carefully define what we mean by an interaction. Ever since the momentum unit, we've been working with this definition of interaction as a way in which objects act upon each other which causes one or both to accelerate. And that was a sensible definition at the time, in part because the easiest effect of an interaction to observe is the acceleration which it causes. We started off by thinking about why a book stops sliding across a floor and came to the conclusion that it was the interaction between the book and the floor, and we could even change the strength of that interaction and change how far the book would go. However, it's now time to move on from that definition and get a better one. In particular, it turns out that not all interactions result in objects accelerating. But we also can get more specific about the properties of interactions now, because now we understand energy, and understanding energy is the key to understanding interactions. When a book slides across the floor, using our definition that we already have, we know that the book and the floor are interacting because the book slows down, which is a kind of acceleration. Similarly, when carts A and B interact in a collision, both carts accelerate, and so we know that the interaction exists between these two carts. But the thing I want to point out, which is really crucial and can't be emphasized enough, is that Every interaction we talk about is between a pair of objects. The book and floor interact, carts A and B interact. The book would not slow down if it wasn't interacting with something. Similarly, you cannot pick yourself up by your own bootlaces. You can't interact with yourself to do anything useful. If you want to get off the floor, you either have to push off the floor and jump, in which case you're interacting with the floor, or you need to reach up to a chin-up bar above you and pull yourself up by interacting with it. So every interaction is between a pair of objects. But the accelerations of the carts or of the book aren't the only effects of these interactions. The book and the floor also warm up slightly, and you know that if there was no friction, which is the particular interaction we're talking about for the book, then no warming up would happen. Similarly, if the collision between the carts is inelastic, then the carts will somehow change state even if that's a very subtle change of state like bent and tangled Velcro bristles. But either way, if the interaction hadn't occurred, the state change in the objects wouldn't occur. So interactions, as well as causing things to accelerate, can cause state changes, which is how we recognize that energy is transforming from one form to another. We can set things up so that there's a state change and no acceleration because of an interaction. For example, with the book sliding across the floor, if you just keep pushing it, you can arrange to make it move at a constant velocity. So now the book and the floor are interacting, and your hand and the book are interacting. Again, note, the pairs, always pairs of objects involved in interactions. Now, the book isn't accelerating at all, it's moving at a constant velocity, but there are still changes. The book and the floor warm up slightly, again because of that interaction between them, the friction, and if you push for long enough, you get a little tired, also because of the interaction between you and the book. Some interactions only happen if the interacting objects are touching each other. For example, the book sliding across the floor slows down because of friction when it's touching the floor. If you throw it across the room so it's not touching the floor, it's not going to slow down. Similarly, when carts collide with their Velcro ends, the entire acceleration during the collision occurs while they're in contact with each other. Interactions like this are called contact interactions because they require contact to occur. On the other hand, there are some interactions which are able to occur even if the objects are not touching. 
For example, I can push these magnets back and forth with another magnet, and by now we're very familiar with carts colliding using magnetic interactions, where no contact occurs between the carts. We call interactions like this long-ranged interactions. When two objects are interacting, and the interaction tends to cause them to accelerate towards each other, we call that an attractive interaction. For example, I can use the magnet in my hand to attract this stack of other magnets towards it. On the other hand, when the interaction causes the objects to be pushed apart, to accelerate away from each other, we call that a repulsive interaction. And again, with magnets, I can turn the magnet in my hand around and it will repel the other magnets. Many interactions, though, can be repulsive or attractive depending on the circumstances. For example, here are two carts interacting with each other via a spring. When the spring is fully relaxed, there's no interaction at all. But if it's stretched, then the interaction is attractive. And if the spring is compressed, then the interaction is repulsive. But many interactions are neither attractive nor repulsive. Friction, for example, is neither attractive nor repulsive. And as we'll see next semester in Phys 1204, magnetic interactions with moving charges are neither attractive nor repulsive. Let's now focus on a pair of objects in an isolated system. And the reason to do that is then we know the only interaction we have to worry about is the interaction between those two objects. So it's a nice simple situation with only one interaction we care about. And so we'll use our usual favorite isolated system, a pair of carts undergoing a collision. And so my system is just the two carts. And there are all sorts of things we already know, but before we've been focusing on the situation before the collision and after. Now let's look at the situation during the collision when the two carts are interacting with each other. Well, you can tell from this Vx versus T graph that cart A must be the higher inertia cart here, right? It has the smaller delta V. Its delta V, in fact, is half that of, of cart B, and so it must have twice the inertia. One way we haven't looked at it so much is to look at the accelerations. And again, during the interaction, both carts accelerate, but they don't accelerate with the same magnitude. Cart A experiences the smaller magnitude of acceleration because it has the higher inertia, right? A smaller delta V in the same time means a smaller acceleration. And also the carts have to accelerate in opposite directions. And so you can see the X components of their acceleration have opposite sign. Well, we've already seen that the consequence of all this is that even during the collision, the system's momentum remains constant. But now let's look at the kinetic energy during the collision. Now, if you look back at the Vx versus T graph, you can see that the relative speed before and after the collision in this collision is the same. And so unsurprisingly, the total kinetic energy before the collision and after the collision are the same. This collision is elastic. However, Look, during the collision, something interesting happens. The system's kinetic energy decreases during the interaction. Now, contrast that. The momentum of the system remains constant all through the collision, including during the collision. But the kinetic energy, even though it's the same before and after the collision, it's decreased during the interaction. Does that surprise you? In fact, we can explain it fairly easily. One way of seeing that the kinetic energy simply can't be constant during the collision is to remember how we derived the kinetic energy not changing in the first place. We derived the kinetic energy not changing in an elastic collision from the fact that the relative speed was unchanged. And sure, if you look at the velocity versus time for this collision, the relative speed before the collision is the same as the relative speed after. That's what we mean by a collision being elastic. But it can't be the same during the collision. Think about it. The two carts start off moving at each other, and after the collision, they're moving away from each other. So the relative velocity certainly changes, and so the relative speed must as well. And in fact, there must be some time, roughly halfway through the collision, when the relative speed is zero. 
Well, if the relative speed has changed, then the kinetic energy must have also changed, and so the kinetic energy has to change during the collision. Let's think about the consequences of the kinetic energy being decreased during the collision. First of all, this system is closed. There are no state changes going on in the environment, and we know that it ends up getting all of its kinetic energy back. So there's no flow of energy out of the system or into the system. So this disappearing kinetic energy during the collision implies that there must be a conversion to internal energy in the system. And that means the carts must be undergoing some kind of state changes. Well, we're going to spend the next video lecture looking at that in detail. For now, I'll just say that for this cart collision, we can see that all of the internal energy gets returned to kinetic energy. And what that's telling us is that whatever the state changes are that these carts are undergoing, they must be reversible. And we've sort of seen this back in the energy unit, that elastic collisions like this one are reversible processes. On the other hand, if we had looked at an inelastic collision of carts, then there would be a conversion to internal energy in the system, and we wouldn't get it all back as kinetic. Some of it would stay as internal energy. Let me just finish up this video lecture by summarizing some characteristics of an interaction. So every interaction involves two objects. For our carts colliding, then it's just the two carts that are interacting with each other. When a book slides across the floor, the pair of interacting objects is the book and the floor. You can't have an interaction with only one object in it. When the system is isolated, then we also know that the momentum is the same during and after the interaction. We already knew the before and after part. The during part is a little bit new. Not all interactions affect the motion of the interacting objects, but for those interactions that do affect the motion of the interacting objects, we know that the accelerations of the two objects in general are not the same. The object with the higher inertia must have the lower acceleration, and we can say more than that, because we know these accelerations have to be directly related to the changes of velocity of the objects, and so they're going to follow the same relationship that we've already seen. In other words, that the ratio of the accelerations is the negative inverse of the ratio of the inertias of the objects. So in other words, if cart A is double the inertia of cart B, its acceleration must be half that of cart B. And finally, we've seen that the system's kinetic energy changes during the interaction. We can get kinetic energy converted into internal energy during the interaction. And if the uh, conversion is reversible, then we will tend to get all of that kinetic energy back but we can also have an irreversible change during the interaction where some of that kinetic energy gets changed permanently into internal energy of the system.